Back home, three square meals a day were a mirage. Now, this is the Savoy without the bill. On average, in the first year of training, each recruit grows one and a half inches and puts on a stone, none of it fat. If you find the finger habit mildly off-putting, remember that they've only just got to grips with shoelaces. Knives and forks are on the agenda, but not yet. Anyway, it was only the other day, 1611 in fact, that knives and forks were introduced to England. But why are these men prepared to die for the British crown? It's simple, he says. We've eaten your rations, we've eaten your salt. The obligation is binding. Obviously, there are times in a soldier's life when room service is not available. For example, the Burma jungle in 1944, when the Japanese were being extremely tiresome. So, for a while, it was grilled beetles garnished with imagination. Their colonel-in-chief has suffered similar indigestion. I've never forgotten one, on one visit um, in Hong Kong. I think we were, they were on an exercise in, uh, uh, in one of the sort of junglier parts of Hong Kong. Uh, where I was then invited to to uh, to come and have um, lunch with them, I think, in the jungle. And I then found myself being given snake, which actually was one of the more disgusting things I think I've ever eaten. They sleep on the floor because they always have. And unacquainted with East Enders, Silla Black, or other icons of British culture, they spend their evening singing songs about Himalayan mountains or hacking people's heads off. <laughs> Local parents, others if they can afford the journey, drop into Pokhara for the farewells. There are also some enterprising young ladies, a Gurkha, even if he is off to Britain for the next three years, is a pretty good catch. But for some, the partings are the worst part of any adventure. Will he ever see his father again? Almost certainly, which is more than can be said for some of the rejected candidates down the years. Their sense of shame was so great that they came to this sinister bridge and threw themselves into the river below. They've now constructed anti-suicide nets. They may be leaving a Shangri-La film set, but they're also departing a world where to be aged and bent is to become a supplicant. This man fought with the Gurkhas in World War II. He did the dirty work. But because he didn't serve 15 years, he doesn't qualify for a British Army pension. Body and soul are now held together by the independent Gurkha Welfare Trust. Each month, he receives a £10 handout, sufficient for a few daily handfuls of rice. Nor had the Trust forgotten the widows of their former colleagues in arms. <laughs> We're talking here of hardship, not hard luck stories. This Gurkha widow lost her husband just after the war and is about to lose the roof over her head. The house was lent to her by relatives who now want to sell it. To augment her £10 a month, she was still forced to work. But where now can she find it? Uh, for 30 days a month. But what she will do? She, she go to the riverside and collect uh, the firewood from the river bank. Uh, normally in the monsoon season, uh, there are lots of them lying either side of the river bank. And you can see her finger collecting piece of wood which lies uh, either side of the river bank. And then uh, uh, she, she can survive. But the problem is obvious. The lady is getting old. The star at the festival of Tihar is a cow. It's plied with drink, probably Horlicks, and sweetmeats. The cow is sacred here, based on the theory that it's the provider of almost everything, from milk when it's living to leather when it's dead. 
The god Krishna declared the cow his favorite animal a thousand years ago, which was fortunate. Without the cow, the Gurkhas would have never have become soldiers of international renown. This is the Lee Enfield Mark VI muzzle loader. Its cartridges were the problem, allegedly for being sealed with paper contaminated by cow grease. David Harding is an ex Gurkha and Bisley champion. The cartridge for the new rifle was greased at the bullet end. Inside this end of the cartridge there was a bullet of this shape. Uh, in this end there was enough powder for one shot. In the process of loading, the sepoy had to bite open the powder end with his teeth so that he could pour the powder into the muzzle. He then reversed the cartridge, pushed the bullet end in, tore off the empty part of the paper and rammed the bullet into the bore. And in the process of biting the cartridge, he would have come in closer contact than he cared for with the grease on the bullet end. The grease was, the rumour was, that it was composed of the fat of pigs and of cows. And the fat of pigs would have been objectionable to the Muslim sepoys, and the fat of cows would have been very objectionable to the Hindu sepoys. And contact with it, um, especially for higher caste Hindus, could cause serious loss of, um, of caste itself and of, uh, could cause social ostracism back in the home village. The British government said, well, get your own grease. But high caste Indians were not to be mollified. They were itching for a fight, believing that the British were crushing their own cultures throughout the land. But the cow grease rumours still persisted. 150 years later, no such taboo was to deflect the young Gurkhas from the obvious venue for their first public meal in Britain. Burger, beef, one. These Gurkhas were serving with the British in India in 1857. At the musketry school in Ambala, they insisted on using the Calgary's cartridge to distance themselves from the whinging Indian troops. But the cow grease rumour continued to fuel the bigger issue. India was seething with anti-British antagonism. The guns were primed for mutiny. <laughs> Delhi, capital of the old Mughal Empire, was the scene of the bloodiest conflict. It was a rising of manic intensity and unspeakable atrocity. Officers were hacked to pieces, their wives, children and servants mutilated before death or thrown live into the city's wells. Major Charles Reed, commander of the Sermor Battalion of Gurkhas, was among those ordered to head to the aid of his beleaguered British colleagues of the 60th Rifles. Within four hours, his relief column was on the way. But the 60th Rifles, pictured here in happier times, as they say, were apprehensive about the Gurkha involvement. Could they trust these Gurkhas, foreign troops after all? They were soon to learn. Fiercely loyal, brave to a man, the Gurkhas actually enjoyed their part in quelling the mutiny. Indeed, when word got abroad, they were accorded the highest of accolades, a rave review in the London Illustrated News. The Fusiliers and a little Gurkha were sitting by a window when one of the enemy, who had concealed himself, popped his head out to see what was doing. He happened to look the other way when the little Gurkha, as quick as thought, whipped out his cookery and sliced his head off in an instant, to the great delight of the Fusiliers, who could not for ten minutes shoulder their muskets for laughing. The cookeries are kept very sharp, and I have seen a Gurkha cutting his corns at arm's length. It is not to be wondered at that these are the dread of the rebels. The few surviving rebels continued to dread. They were simply tied to gun barrels and dispatched to join their holy cow in the sky. Among the heroes of the Gurkhas action was Subadar Major Jesse Rajput with medals. Never again would the integrity of these fighting men from Nepal be questioned. Their campaigns were commemorated on their chests, and such now was their reputation that Queen Victoria herself intervened, promoting them to a rifle regiment. But rifle regiments don't carry colours, so she presented them with a ceremonial truncheon.
The truncheon uh, has been more than a regimental color to us. In, in our language, uh, it's called Nisani Mai. Uh, little meaning Nisani is a point, and Mai is a uh, mother, if not a goddess. So it's, it's more like a goddess to us than a simple uh, regimental color.